Koppel, host of the Time for Coffee podcast, where you get firsthand career advice into the jobs and industries that interest you the most. And before we start today's show, I have a quick favor to ask you. If you haven't already, I'd be incredibly grateful if you give us a rating and a review on iTunes. And if you're like me, you need to do it now because you'll forget later and because it's the best way to help others who may be in search of career advice to find this free resource. So press pause if you haven't done it and do it right now. I'll wait. Thanks so much and enjoy today's show. Hey there, Java Junkies. Welcome back to another episode of T4C. If you're interested in theater and acting, then this is the episode for you because my next guest is an actress and audiophile earphones award-winning narrator who has recorded over 150 titles in fiction and nonfiction. And by the way, this is not the same as voiceover work. But before I introduce you to the talented Elizabeth Rogers, I want to make sure you've signed up for the Java Junkies Journal. That's Time for Coffee's weekly newsletter that comes out on Mondays and gives you a sneak peek into the episodes and the professionals we're going to be featuring that week. All you need to do is head over to the Time for Coffee website at time, the number four, coffee.org, and the sign up box is right there. Now, my Arabica-loving audiophiles, please grab your mug and take a chug of your favorite caffeinated brew, because it's time for another caffeinated career conversation. And my guest is Elizabeth Rogers, actress on the stage, off-Broadway, and in television and film, as well as an award-winning audiobook narrator whose voice can be heard on recordings of Dozens upon dozens of books for a multitude of publishers, including Audible, Blackstone, Brilliance, Hatchet, Harper, and Recorded Books. Elizabeth also does corporate leadership training. And Elizabeth is currently in rehearsal for Troilus and Cressida, as well as a workshop of a new musical that has actually been written by a teenager called Farewell Chris Yee. Elizabeth, welcome to Time for Coffee. Are you caffeinated and ready to go? I am indeed. Thank you so much, Andrea. It's lovely to be here. Sounds like my cat in the background is also very happy to be here. I was just <laughs> going to say, your cat is talking and saying, we're here, we're here. Uh, you have two cats and we just need to be ready because before we started this <laughs> recording, it was super funny. All of a sudden we heard like this sounded like a bang to me. And it was, I guess, one of the cats had gone into a paper bag. Yes. And the other one jumped on top of it. (laughs) So it's going to be a very interactive interview (laughs) here as we get into our 10 espresso shots, which we are framing around audiobook narration or narrating audiobooks. We may even pepper in there a few sort of how do you break into acting type tips. But I should also let our listeners know that they should check out the show notes for this episode to see if Elizabeth's main Time for Coffee interview, and that's the one in which we're going to get into how she has built her career, what she does as an audiobook narrator, as well as a corporate leadership trainer, and of course, as an actress. Uh, But check out show notes to see if that episode has already dropped. So here we go. First espresso shot, Elizabeth, what entry-level jobs are available to young people who want to break into audiobook narrating? Well, as far as entry-level positions, the best way to think about that is to maybe get in touch with somebody and take a class, first of all. And there are a number of different people who teach wonderful classes or who are coaches to sort of tell somebody whether or not this might be for them. The unions also, the acting unions, sometimes do workshops with people. They'll have an audiobook director or producer come in and have an evening or an afternoon of meeting a bunch of people and listening to them and letting them know if they think that they that this might be a career for them. 
But my suggestion is to try to find an organization. There are they're all over the place where you can volunteer to either read to people live or to record for the blind or for people who need help. There are many, many organizations where you can go in and read the newspaper or magazines and just to get some practice in a studio and with a microphone and hearing yourself and being able to see if this is something that you have the skill for or the desire for really, because it's very different from everybody thinks it's some, it's one thing and it's a lot of other things. Okay. Well, that's super helpful. And we should let our listeners know that your audiobook narration training came from someone by the name of Robin Miles. Yes. Robin was my mentor. She's, she basically dragged me into this industry kind of kicking and screaming. She like said, you're good. You're going to be good at this and I'm going to make that, make it happen. Or if it kills me. <laughs> so, <laughs> Well, clearly but I it did. didn't I kill her, her. I hope. No, it didn't. I took her class and she handed off what I had recorded in her class to somebody at the now defunct studios at the American Foundation for the Blind, which they closed the studios. So now they use other studios to record books for the Library of Congress for the blind and disabled. And she handed my CD of some of what I had recorded in the class to the casting director there. He brought me in for an audition and they hired me. And that was in 2006. Oh boy. Wow. So basically 14 years ago. Yeah. Yeah. So Elizabeth, I'm going to tweak the next espresso shot Mm -hmm. Because usually I ask, what's a useful hard and soft skill or skills that you look for in the young people that you hire? And I'm going to tweak that and just ask, what is a useful hard or soft skill or skills that you think audiobook narrators need to have? When I'm asked this type of question, I have a sort of a stock answer because I don't hire people, but two things to find out if it's something that you want to do and to find out if it's something that you can do or might be able to do, go to your bookshelf, grab the thickest, densest, most boring or full of terms that nobody understands book that you can find. Lock yourself in a closet with a light for six hours. You can take breaks, but lock yourself in a closet and read out loud. And don't just read it to get the words out, but read for understanding and to convey what you're reading to a listener and then do it again the next day and then do it again the next day. And if you still have any voice left and if you still think you might want to do this, then you should take a class. Hmm. Oh my (laughs) God. That is, um, that sounds pretty tough. It's exceedingly challenging. And A lot of people think, oh, wow, that sounds so much fun. I could do that. People tell me I have a nice voice. And having a nice voice is very important. And being able to play characters with your voice. When we're on stage, we're playing characters with everything, with our entire instrument, with our bodies, with our faces, with our voices. But in the studio, in an audiobook, all you have is your voice. And so you have to be able to tell a story without somebody watching how you use your hands or how you're using your face. And you have to be able to maintain that, maintain that focus while also making sure that you're not making any mistakes. If you make a mistake, you have to stop and go back. You have to make sure that you are filling it and make sure that you are making it understood while playing the scenes. If you're doing fiction, playing the scenes between all of the actors, you're not just playing one part, you're playing everybody. So you have to distinguish among all of the different characters, change your voice for all of the different characters, maybe have an accent for one or two of them. Sometimes the accents don't flow easily between the two characters and you have to work on that and you may have to stop and go back and do it again. And it's multitasking. It requires enormous focus and it requires incredible vocal stamina. That is extremely helpful. Thank you so much. So what kind of life experiences, Elizabeth, and by that I mean experiences outside the classroom for our young listeners who are in college right now, what are the most useful ones to have for someone starting out in this field? The ability to really have a vivid imagination that you can draw on. So play and dream, daydream. And I will say on the other end of the spectrum, living on a budget. You have to really, really, really know that this is the only thing 
that you want to do. I also say to young people when they're considering getting into acting, is there anything else that you jazzes you, that just turns you on as far as something that you could consider doing for a career? If the idea of teaching really turns you on, or if the idea of whatever other kind of job that you be, I mean, there are thousands of them, you know, coding or, or being an engineer or creating a new app or creating some sort of new technology turns you on, do that. No, really? Because, do that. <laughs> do that. Because I'm a freelancer. I've been a freelancer for, I'm not going to say how many years, but for, for more years than any of the listeners have been alive. And you never really get used to not knowing where your next job is going to come from or when it's going to happen or how much you're going to get paid. So you have to be comfortable with not being rich and famous because that only happens for a tiny, tiny, tiny percentage of people who are in this, in any of the fields that I work in. And so you have to be prepared to be a journeyman and to stretch your paychecks and live with roommates or live in a less than glamorous apartment and be able to budget and be able to live with uncertainty. That is so useful to hear and so important. Elizabeth, what about someone's major? Is it a deciding factor to get into this profession? Now, I recognize, at least I don't think there are colleges out there that teach audio narration. There clearly are many colleges that have a theater program. They have acting programs, and yeah. acting programs and, and whatnot. So do you think if they haven't studied it, is it a deal breaker? Not necessarily as far as a college major, but I think you do need to study it in the professional world once you've graduated or if you can study it. There are schools. In fact, I know people who teach in colleges as part of MFA programs or part of conservatory programs will teach classes in audiobook narration. That is starting to happen. But I did not study. I studied theater. I studied English and theater. It's not a deal breaker for sure. I think studying voice, I'm a singer as well. And I think singing really prepared me very well for this. And I think I also studied literature and I think that helps a lot as well. But I don't think any of it is a deal breaker. I think become a well-rounded human being who can dip into lots of different experiences in different areas. I read, as you said, everything from nonfiction to fiction. And then I do Shakespeare. I work with corporate people. It's good to have a wide range of sort of exposure. So I don't think it's a deal breaker in terms of what you major in in college. Terrific. What about a graduate school degree and less so for someone who's starting out in the field and maybe more so for someone who may want to have options down the line? And if so, Elizabeth, what do you think would be the most useful ones to have? I don't have a graduate degree. I tried. I applied to MFA programs a couple of times and I did not get in, which we'll talk about later. But I think an MFA in performance or in directing or an, an MLIT, none of those things would hurt. It helps as an actor in general to have an MFA really helps a lot. And that also allows you to then have the option to teach further down the line if that's something that you are interested in. Great. So I think this is probably going to be an easy question for you. <laughs> what is the best part for you, Elizabeth, of being an actor and being an audiobook narrator? Well, perhaps the surprising answer, it's not necessarily the applause or the getting to play all the different characters, but it's the people that I get to work with. It's the other performers, the directors, the incredible group of people who pour themselves body and soul into doing what we do and usually for very little or no money. In terms of audiobooks, I have been very, very lucky to have worked with and to continue to work with remarkable publishers, producers. They're all wonderful people, but, but especially the engineers who get very, very little notice and very little credit. But the people who are on the other side of the glass, who are making me sound good, who are keeping their eye out for mistakes, who are building me up and helping me get through it when it's really difficult, or who are laughing with me when it's ridiculous. It's a very solitary profession, actually. And so you're in a little box all day, and there's one other person out there. If you're lucky, a lot of people do it 
self-record. And I can't even imagine doing that. I need to interact with other people. And so the people are what really make it amazing for me. You're right. I am surprised. That's a really interesting insight. And I think an important one. Okay. We know no matter what the job is, as much as you may love it, as passionate as you may be about it, there are always aspects that aren't fun. So what is the part of your current job, Elizabeth, that sucks the most? Having to hustle for work. Self-promotion. I've never been good at it. It makes me nervous. It gives me a stomach ache. I don't have an agent. Currently, I have in the past, but I don't have an agent. And so I have to put myself out there. You know, when there's no work on the calendar, I have to go out and ask for it and try to find it and make it happen. And I've never been a salesman. And so it's, it's um, unpleasant for me. It's not a happy experience. The other part, which is related is not knowing whether there's the fear of not knowing whether there's going to be any work and then sort of figuring out how to connect with people, how to sell yourself, how to, uh, bite the bullet and put yourself out there and ask for a raise. That's a really hard one. Um, Especially for women. Oh my God. Yes, absolutely. And so, and then loneliness, really, as I said, it's very solitary. And most of the work that I do is by myself. Most of the work that I do is not in the studio. It's preparing for the studio. And that is, that's why I have cats. (laughs) (laughs) And why I have a dog. I work from home. So I totally get that. Totally get that. So three final espresso shots. What is the best career advice you've ever gotten, Elizabeth? I sort of distilled this and it's come from many different places in many different forms. But I think the kernel of it, the heart of it is figuring out where you fit. And it may not be where you think you fit or where you want to fit. The roles that you will play or the books that you will do may not be the ones you think you're best for. You have to listen to how you're being cast, where you're being cast, and what is working the best. My experience is that as much as I would love to do exciting adventure stories or fluffy romances, that's not where I get cast. And I get cast in the denser, more difficult, darker types of literature that is harder to take and more intense. And so I've sort of found my niche. You can't figure it out right away, obviously. It takes a while to sort of figure that out. But once you figure it out, then it becomes easier to go, okay, this is this is where I fit. This is what I do. And then really hone your skills. And are you speaking specifically about audiobook narration? Are you speaking about acting for theater or is it both? It's both. Very quick story that will illustrate this. In college, a very good friend of mine was preparing to direct a production of Agnes of God. And I desperately wanted to play Agnes, desperately. But the director said to me, if I cast you as Agnes, who am I going to get to play the Mother Superior? And I didn't want to hear that. I wanted to play the young woman. I wanted to play the main role. And I would have loved to have played the psychiatrist too. But what I understood her saying is that I could play of all the college students that she had the choice of to play the mother superior, the older woman. There aren't as many who can do that. And so I played a lot of older women, which actually kind of threw me off at the beginning of my acting career after I graduated because I was so used to playing the older women and the more heavy roles that when I graduated and was out in the real world with other people my age, where I could have perhaps played younger roles, what I discovered is I'm a leading lady. I never got to play the ingenue because I'm tall, because of the quality of my voice and because of the nature of my everything, the nature of my physicality and my personality. Hmm. And so I, it, that took some getting used to and I was disappointed. But then you realize, okay, that's not going to be my career. I'm not going to be playing the ingenue in the musical. I'm not going to be playing Juliet. I'm going to be playing her mother. Yeah. So, so it's important to be open. Yes. Mm. And to recognize what makes you special, what makes you different. Because there are a thousand girls out there who can play all those ingenues. Absolutely. Okay. Two final questions for you. What movies, if any, or Netflix, Hulu, Amazon shows 
or books do you think accurately depict your profession? As far as the audiobook narration, none that I've read, although I don't get to read much outside of what I'm reading for work. So <laughs> okay. I, oh, that's the other thing that sucks is that I don't get to read for pleasure anymore. I do have a friend who wrote a book about her life as an audiobook narrator. She's probably the best known. She's sort of, they call her the Meryl Streep of audiobooks. Her name is Barbara Rosenblatt. And she wrote a book called Audiobook Narrator, The Art of Recording Audiobooks. I have not read it, but I would guess that that would be a pretty great place to start. As far as theater acting, God, there are thousands of them. There's a movie called A Midwinter's Tale, if you're interested in Shakespeare acting, that I just adore. It was directed and produced by Kenneth Branagh. And there was a series, Canadian series called Slings and Arrows about a theater company that was one of the most brilliant things I've ever seen, probably a decade or 15 years ago, at least. Wonderful. I'll make sure to include all of that in the show notes. I'm also wondering, have you seen the Kaminsky Method on Netflix? I have not. I have not yet. Again, I just... <laughs> yeah, you don't I, have I don't, time. I don't watch a lot of television. I'm actually sort of in the midst of right now, while I'm in rehearsal and also preparing books, trying to watch as many of these films and TV shows as I can because the SAG Awards are coming up and I want to vote. And so I need to watch all these things and I'm trying to find the time to sort of plug them in. <laughs> and that's one of them. And I've heard wonderful things about it, but I have not. Yeah, it's wonderful. Alan Arkin and Michael Douglas um, yeah. among, among the, the two. And it's about an aging acting coach for those who haven't heard of it. Final espresso shot. What would Java junkies be surprised to learn about your profession? I touched on it already a little bit, but the solitude, the absolute lack of glamour. People think, oh my God, that would be so much fun to just tell stories all day. And it sounds so glamorous and it is absolutely not. If I didn't have to, if I were working from home, as many people do, I would be in my pajamas all day. And I'm practically in my pajamas all day when I go to the studio because you can't wear clothing that makes noise. So you have to wear soft clothing. That's something nobody ever thinks about. And the majority of the work is in preparation. And that is time spent by myself reading and working and researching with the manuscript. And the theater end of it is very social. But the audiobook career, it's not very social for the majority of the work. So that's what I would say is probably the most surprising. And basically, you have to give up reading. I, I usually get one book in a summer that I've chosen to read. But otherwise... I don't get to read for pleasure. Oh, boy. Which okay. <laughs> Which is a bummer. It's a Absolutely. bummer. Absolutely. But I will say some of the books that you have read, many of them mm -hmm. are pretty cool books. So oh, yeah. Fascinating. I'm sure you're they, also I learning will, a ton. I am. And I will say that the majority, again, it's sort of like percentage. 25% of what I do is fascinating and interesting. And none of these are books that I would have picked up off the shelf myself. And so I'm, I feel very lucky to have been exposed to stuff that I would not have sought out. But 75% of it is pretty run of the mill fluff. Yeah. And not something that I really would have any interest in reading myself. But that is very popular. And sells very well. And then there's also a lot of really violent stuff that, again, people seem to really buy it, but I personally don't like it. But you have to, again, sort of bite the bullet and say, all right, I have to do this unless you're turning down books left and right and can say, no, I'd really rather not do this. Then you have to stomach it. You have to sort of accept the material and gird yourself to do it, even if it's something that you find really unpleasant. Such important points to share with our young <laughs> listeners, Elizabeth. Thank you so much for making Time for Coffee today with me and the Time for Coffee community. Again, if our listeners want to learn more about what it takes to do audiobook narration and how Elizabeth has built this career, which involves both film and stage and off-Broadway and regional touring, in addition to corporate coaching and, of course, audiobook narration. Check out the show notes for this episode to see if her main Time for Coffee interview has already dropped. Elizabeth, thank you so much. Thank you, Andrea. Thanks so much for listening to this latest episode of T4C. 
And if you're interested in learning more about my coaching services for confused college students and recent grads, feel free to check out the Time for Coffee website under the Coaching tab at time, the number 4, coffee.org or text me at 202-236-5712. That's 202-236-5712. Oh, 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 o